When Rice University trustee emerita and current president of Prairie View A&M University, Ruth Simmons, visited Rice in February to help launch the public work of the Task Force on Slavery, Segregation, and Racial Injustice, she left us quite a few ideas that it would be in our interest to return to and to sit with from time to time as the work of this task force unfolds. I'd like to relate two of them as a way of helping to get us started today. Concerning the absolute necessity of the kind of work Rice's task force aims to undertake, Dr. Simmons argued that there were compelling reasons for all of us to confront the legacies of slavery and related injustices with honesty and urgency. The delay, she said, in coming to terms with inhumane past practices not only forestalls the ne necessary societal healing required, but potentially creates the impression of a willing, ongoing complicity with such actions. Dr. Simmons also expressed great faith in the ability of university communities to undertake exactly this kind of work, as long as as long as the debate is honest and true, as long as the fact finding is genuine, as long as you rely on the treasured expertise of universities and the wonderful processes used in the university. Today's webinar on movements, monuments, and racism on campus depends very much on these two ideas. The urgency of historical questioning for our lives in the present, and the transforming power of the university. I'm Alex Bird of the Rice University Department of History and co-chair with Caleb McDaniel of the Task Force on Slavery, Segregation, and Racial Injustice. Today, it is our great honor to enter into conversation with four scholars with deep experience tackling questions related to racism, history, and the university. James Campbell is Edgar E. Robinson Professor in United States History at Stanford University. He is the author, among other things, of Middle Passages, African American Journeys to Africa, and Songs of Zion, the African Methodist Episcopal Church in the United States and South Africa. When at Brown University, Dr. Campbell chaired the University Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice. Hillary Green is Associate Professor of History in the Department of Gender and Race Studies at the University of Alabama. She is the author of Educational Reconstruction, African American Schools in the Urban South, 1865 to 1890, and numerous essays and book chapters. Dr. Green is the founder of the Hallowed Grounds Project, focused on slavery and the University of Alabama. She is presently at work on two research projects, a book on African-American memories and commemorations of the Civil War, and a documentary reader on Confederate memorial debates. Leslie Harris is professor of history and African-American studies at Northwestern University. Dr. Harris is the author of In the Shadow of Slavery, African-Americans in New York City, and the co-editor with Diana Ramsey Berry of Sexuality and Slavery, Reclaiming Intimate Histories of the Americas. While at Emory University, she co-founded and directed the Transforming Community Project, which made use of history and dialogue to address pressing matters related to race and other forms of diversity in higher education. In 2011, TCP hosted the path-breaking conference, Slavery and the University out of which came a volume of the same name edited by Dr. Harris, Dr. Campbell, who's also here, and Alfred L. Brophy. Anne Twitty is Associate Professor of History and Chair of the Undergraduate Program at the University of Mississippi. She is the author of Before Dred Scott, Slavery and Legal Culture in the American Confluence. Her next project explores forms of unfreedom that persisted in the putative free North in the early national and antebellum periods. She is a member of the University of Mississippi Slavery Research Group and serves on the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on History and Context. Dr. Twitty's June 19th essay in the Atlantic Magazine recounts debates over Confederate iconography at the university 
especially the 30-foot-tall Confederate monument at the school's entrance. Dr. McDaniel will moderate today's discussion. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions that you would like to hear addressed. We may not get to all of your questions today, but the task force will organize subsequent opportunities for additional conversation in weeks ahead. Please keep an eye out at taskforce.rice.edu for further information. Passing it on to Dr. McDaniel. Thank you, Dr. Bird. And I'd like to uh, invite all of the other panelists uh, onto the screen if you can turn on your video. And I just want to say on behalf of uh, the task force as a whole, Dr. Bird and I are so thankful to each of you for taking the time to speak with us today and with our audience about this very important subject. You know, as Dr. Bird mentioned, our first public event here at Rice for the uh, Task Force on Slavery, Segregation, and Racial Injustice was a lecture by President Ruth Simmons in February. And it's sort of difficult to fathom just how much uh, has uh, changed in the world that we live in in a few short months. Uh, we've, of course, had our universities disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've also seen uh, protests that have swept the country against racial injustice and have really intensified a focus on history and on uh, monuments and memorialization and the way we talk about our history. Um, that's, of course, spread to campuses. And even in the couple of weeks since we reached out to you to be on this panel, uh, new headlines ha have, have come out, uh, whether it's from Princeton University's announcement that it would remove the name of Woodrow Wilson from its School of Public Policy uh, to a petitioning campaign here at Rice about a statue of our founder, William Marsh Rice, in our central quad. Uh, so a lot is, is happening, and I'm really grateful to all of you for being here to provide some perspective on these events. And I wonder if we could start just by taking a step back uh, and situating this moment in a longer history. Professor Harris, you've, of course, been uh, a leader in this uh, movement on campuses to investigate the history of universities studying slavery. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about uh, when this movement got started and how has it evolved over time? Sure, and thanks for having this panel discussion and for inviting me to be part of it. Um, we can chart this particular moment we're in, we're at almost the 20 year mark. Um, in the late 90s, a few people began researching the histories of slavery and race at their institutions. I can point to Mark Auslander at Emory, who had an undergraduate course that investigated the history of slavery at Emory's first campus in Oxford, Georgia, now called Oxford College. And um, in the early 2000s, a group of graduate students at Yale put out a study um, in response to Yale's um, anniversary celebrations and also the founding of the Gilder Lehrman Center there, where they said that Yale had not, had only upheld its history of an abolitionists. It had not talked about its relationship to slavery. Um, those moments uh, were inspired by local events, but I would also say were inspired by a general global moment. I mean, if you remember, this is also the time when we had the TRC Commission in South Africa and a number of other uh, uh, institutions follow that um, uh, example set there. Um, of course, we, uh, Mark Brown and the work of my colleague Jim Campbell, along with Ruth Simmons, as really um, taking these ideas and, and really elevating them as an example for other institutions. So the early 2000s are really when these began to appear on a national and indeed uh, for many an international landscape. But I also want to say that this is a very much a start and stop um, uh, process. It took a little bit of time for um, things to take off. 2004, University of Alabama had their um, apology. UNC also had a uh, uh, recognition of slavery, the creation of the unfound, um, uh, excuse me, the unnamed uh, workers memorial there. But a lot of institutions really resisted the call to investigate their histories of slavery um, uh, until uh, the really uh, almost the first decade of the uh, 2000s. Uh, most Ivy League institutions strongly resisted. 
researching. So often you see faculty and student groups continuing to do that work without the support of the upper administration. This is true at Harvard. Um, at UPenn, most recently, students said that there must be some history of slavery here and it was denied. And then those students in the last couple of years have, um, along with a faculty member, Kathy Brown, have researched the history of uh, UPenn's medical school. But for most of the 20 years that we're talking, upper administrations have resisted it. They've been afraid that uncovering this history, this is a call, you know, uh, something that is often said will make people angry as if uh, history makes people angry. Um, <laughs> it doesn't, you know, th and they, when they say that, they're fearing uh, the descendants of enslaved people as opposed to um, anyone else. But uh, in my own experience, what I found is that it, it kind of brings a sigh of relief when the reality of these histories begins to be exposed instead of being repressed. Anyway, so we're at a moment now, 20 years in, where um, at my best count, along with the, um, school studying slavery organization at UVA. We're at about 70 schools across the nation that have um, engaged in this work in some way of recovery and um, are uh, continuing to do that work. Of course, most of these schools are schools that have a little bit more money, have a re you know, research strong agenda um, and, and can spare faculty and courses towards doing these kinds of initiatives. Thank you. And uh, maybe we could, you know, turn from from that history of what's been happening on campuses back for a moment to the present moment uh, and beyond campus to um, the, the protest movements that we've been seeing in, in recent months. Uh, Professor Green, I just saw in an article today that you uh, you commented that this present movement that we're seeing uh, in cities across the country has made old history more visible. And I know that you have been keeping a database and a map of how the movement has been affecting different uh, monuments and memorials across the country. Can you give us a, a little bit of an overview of uh, how the movement is making old history more visible? Yes, and thank you for having me because one of the reasons why I started collecting this data is because of my own campus and the five-year conversation, which I was reminded of today, Five years ago today, I was prepping my first tour on slavery at UA in a class structure. And it's been a crazy five years. And as my monument on our campus fell, um, I started noticing other monuments started to fall at a staggering pace. Nothing that I have ever seen. And I looked at it today when I did my update. We've had 60 of George Floyd Confederate monuments taken down. That's monuments, plaques, and uh, memorials. I did not do street names just that globally, when you think about indigenous history, Christopher Columbus, other, that's another 55. And we've had 47 promises for future ones. Already between those monuments come down, you're at 100, uh, 115. And then with those promises come reality, you're at 162. And we're not even halfway through this year. <laughs> it hasn't been <laughs> six weeks. So what do we do? So for me, tracking these and this noting the monument location and news coverage was helpful in creating order to the chaos and realizing this is a moment. This is unlike I've ever seen. And rather than being anecdotal, like actually going through and collecting, because I know I'm wrestling with my campus's history. I'm going to be dealing with students in the fall <laughs> you know, during my sabbatical while I'm researching this history more and others needing teaching resources. So that map was a development to help myself but also future teachers who have to teach this moment in real time, but also to, to document as a historian what is going on. And for me, this legacy is a tie to my own campus history of slavery. And the, since 2004, the apology, the 2006 marker, this is the new phase because we had three Confederate monuments and two, uh, one monument and two plaques removed. We're part of this larger footnote even on this movement. So how does UA position this in? So for me, it's a staggering pace. It's an interest to be a witness to this history, but at the same time, like, when is it going to stop? I don't know. <laughs> so I've been busy, <laughs> quite busy with this. 
Well, thank you for taking the time to, to speak with us. And, uh, you know, I think we were talking even before this broadcast began, that it's interesting how much of this is taking place during the summer when universities are, are not really fully in session and, and students haven't been on campus by and large. Um, and I'm wondering a little bit, uh, Professor Campbell, about the role of universities, the role that universities can or should play uh, in thinking about this moment that Professor Green has just been describing. I know that uh, when President Simmons was here and also in, in the essay she included in the book that you and Professor Harris uh, edited, she really stressed the unique power of universities to uh, help uh, the civic culture and uh, our communities think through questions like what monuments should should be in our public landscape. So from your perspective, is there something unique or different about uh, universities as opposed to other institutions in addressing some of these uh, questions? Yeah, thanks. Let me just again thank, like everyone else, thanks for having me. Um, and thank you also for invoking the name of Ruth Simmons, who I, I really think it was her courage in launching this at uh, Brown that uh, kind of called the question for a lot of universities. Um, let me start by telling you a little story about Ruth that, and then sort of go around the mountain a little bit to answer your question. Uh, I'm actually a Rice parent. Two of my kids went to Rice. And I had the singular good fortune after we had just finished our, um, the Slavery and Justice Report, which was a two or three year enterprise, the committee that she had appointed. Um, I went to a parents weekend at Rice and it just so happened that the speaker there was Ruth Simmons. And it just so happened that her topic was the exercise that we had just been through. And she didn't know I was there. So I got to sort of be a fly on the wall and hear her talk about the work that the committee that I was on had just completed. And, you know, you've been at these kinds of events, you know, and President Lebron was there and introduced her lavishly and all of that. And she went up and she's a remarkable person and she has a kind of, uh, a kind of laser-like understanding about when you, what universities are and how they work. And, and she started by just, you know, the kind of niceties about how happy she was to be here and how wonderful it was and so forth. And as a Houston native, well, she'd grown up in Houston. She'd actually grown up as a sharecropper and her family moved to Houston's fifth ward because, so she could go to high school. And she talked about, you know, how, what the lovely day she'd had of walking around Rice's campus. And it meant a great deal to her because the one thing she had known about Rice growing up as a black person in Houston was that she wasn't welcome on the campus and that she'd felt very welcome today and she was grateful for that. And she let that sit there. And it was, it was such a deft moment, right? Because she wasn't like, taking the nose of the president who just welcomed her and sort of rubbing his nose and something unpleasant. She was telling us something, right? She was telling us that universities have the capacity to surprise us, that they outgrow the expectations of their founders and that they will outgrow our expectations too. And they do so not because they turn their backs on their past, but actually because they uphold the values that they profess and they live out their logic. And I think that was really something that she drilled into us in her appointment of the committee at Brown, that universities are special places. And the purpose of this is actually not to kind of run down universities or delegitimize them, but actually to call them to their better selves, to really uh, call them to live out the values that they profess. And those are values that include skepticism, that include evidence-based argument, and that include an appreciation of history. I mean, universities are very unusual in our society in that they are institutions which ritualize and express their identity as communities across time. You know, when you enter a university, you're part of a parade that started before you got there, and you're part of a parade that will continue long after you are gone. And if institutions of that character and professing those values uh, don't have the courage to actually look truthfully at their own history, it's hard to imagine what other institutions might. Thank you for that. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, in a lot of these cases that we've been talking about, uh, we're seeing what universities bring to the table, but of course they're, they're bringing uh, to the table 
sometimes a different set of values depending on where they're located, um, depending on what kind of officials in a political or public capacity they're interacting with. Um, I know that Professor Twitty, in, in your case at the University of Mississippi, um, the campus has, has been in the middle of this moment uh, where Mississippi announced that it would remove uh, the Confederate uh, emblem from its state flag, while at the same time at the university, there's been a lot of conversations about uh, a Confederate monument that's on the campus there. I wonder if you could share a little bit about your experience uh, in, in those discussions and the ways in which it, it has or has not exemplified what Professor Campbell just uh, just laid out for us. Well, it feels like it's been a very long moment. And I, 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 wanna, I wanna echo what everybody else has been saying about how wonderful it is to have this opportunity kind of in the midst of, of, of this you know, rapidly evolving, rapidly moving conversation um, to get together to, to talk about some of our experiences and, and to think through not only where we are, but, but where we're headed. Um, you know, unlike many of my colleagues on this, this panel, I'm relatively new to this work. I really got involved in it because I got hired at the University of Mississippi and because the University of Mississippi has a very prominent Confederate monument and because um, I found myself kind of at the center of a lot of activism surrounding that monument starting from about 2016 on. Um, and so I, I feel like I've learned a lot in a fairly compressed period of time. Um, and while we are, you know, in, in the summer of, of of 2020, um, living in the aftermath of you know just massive protests after the the, the killing of, of George Floyd, a lot of the things that are happening right now are the result of years and sometimes decades worth of work, uh, sort of behind the scenes, not very well publicized work. That's certainly true in the case of the Mississippi Legislature's recent decision to finally do away with a state flag. That has been a subject of controversy in the state of Mississippi for decades, and there have been people working on that issue for decades. Similarly, at the University of Mississippi, um, for the last, at least since 2016, there have been people pushing adamantly um, to you know, first contextualize um, the Confederate monument on, on campus and a little bit later to relocate it. And, and relocation was always a compromise, I think, in the minds um, of, of those of us who were, who were pushing for it. Mississippi, like a lot of Southern states, has a law on the books. It's a 2004 law, but it has a law on the books that uh, basically makes it illegal to simply get rid of these monuments. They can be relocated uh, with appropriate permissions, but they can't be done away with entirely. And that's created a tremendous number of problems, not only here at the University of Mississippi and on other college campuses in Mississippi, uh, but also for county governments um, all across the state um, who are now scrambling to figure out where could we relocate these monuments if we decided to do that. So, Students at the University of Mississippi um, have really been at the, at the center um, of efforts to get our monument relocated. Um, there have been uh, protests um, that have been noisy and maybe a little bit more radical. There have been student government types who've been really involved in, in trying to work kind of official channels. Um, and ultimately in March of 2019, um, a group of students um, had written a piece of legislation for what was called the Associated Student Body. It's the student government at the University of Mississippi. And they got that resolution passed unanimously. It was a resolution calling for the relocation of the monument. And other governing bodies on campus followed suit in, in, in the, the weeks that followed. So there was unanimity on campus among campus stakeholders about the need to relocate this monument. And then we entered into this period in which the administration said that it needed to seek the approval of uh, the governing board. Uh, it's called the Institutions of Higher Learning Board here in Mississippi that oversees all colleges and universities in Mississippi that are public. Um, we don't have our own board of trustees, so we can't turn to our own board of trustees. We have to ask permission from this IHL body and they dragged their feet uh, for a really long time. And, and ultimately they finally granted approval for relocation in June of 2020, at the same time, plans leaked out that indicated uh, that when the university relocated the monument, it would be spending $1.15 million to uh, aggrandize that space and to add new historically inaccurate headstones um, to the Confederate cemetery, which is the space um, that had been selected for the Confederate monuments relocation. So that we, we, are, we are kind of in a different fight uh, at this point at the University of Mississippi. Everybody, everywhere else, 
it seems um, the fight is over taking these symbols down. Uh, we are currently enmeshed in a battle to prevent our administrators from building what we see as a lost cause shrine in June of 2020. So um, it feels like we're a little bit behind the times, um, but hopefully, you know, the recent progress that's been made on the state flag makes it uh, possible uh, to, to push forward and prevent um, the, the, the further solidification of, of these sort of symbols, the further aggrandizement of, of the lost cause on our campus. I think when, you, when you're referring to the lost cause, maybe for our, our audience that's not, not familiar, um, could you give a little brief thumbnail sketch of what you mean by that? Sure, so generally speaking, the lost cause is this ideology that takes hold uh, in the United States. It's first promulgated by former Confederates, uh, but, but comes to be accepted by most white Americans by the end of the 19th century and for most of the 20th century, certainly a significant portion of the 20th century. And there's several different aspects of, of the lost cause, um, one of the most significant being that supposedly the Civil War isn't fought as a war over slavery, it's fought uh, to defend uh, the ideology of states' rights. Uh, the Lost Cause also suggests that the darkest moment in American history is this period of reconstruction when Black people are given a measure of uh, political um, and social power, and that that had been a real inversion of sort of the natural order of things, uh, one to be repudiated and to be fought against. And these Confederate monuments that spring up all over the country um, are an attempt to impose this lost cause ideology, I think, on um, all those who, who walk in the shadow of these monuments um, and to really send a strong message to Black Americans that although they might have enjoyed some power during Reconstruction, that period is over and it is not going to return. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, I think a lot of these uh, cases at the University of Mississippi, at the University of Alabama, elsewhere, uh, in, involve Confederate symbols and, and the lost cause uh, myth. One of the things that's interesting about uh, this moment is how um, protests have focused not just on Confederate symbology, um, but have gone beyond Confederate monuments as well. And so as we turn you know, from campus conversations to the national conversation, I think one thing that a lot of people are grappling with is uh, how, to, how to deal with not just Confederate statues, but statues, for example, to slaveholders, or as in the case of you know, Woodrow Wilson, people who lived long after um, abolition, but maybe promulgated the kinds of ideas that you were just talking about and, and continued uh, to embrace white supremacy in, into the 20th century. Uh, I, I noticed this morning there was a, an op-ed in the New York Times by a descendant of Thomas Jefferson who was arguing that the Jefferson Memorial should be uh, taken down and, and focusing in his remarks on the uh, Hemings uh, uh, family and Jefferson's treatment of, of Sally Hemings. But then I know also that uh, Harvard professor Annette Gordon-Reed, uh, who's written more than anyone about Jefferson and, and the Hemingses, uh, takes sort of a different position on, on Jefferson uh, monuments in particular. So one question, you know, Professor Harris, that, that I'd ask is, how can we think about, about um, deliberating in, in cases like that uh, as a historian? Are there criteria, are there thought processes that, that you recommend to students or, or people on campus or beyond you know, for how to grapple with these, these complicated questions about uh, not just Confederate monuments, but beyond uh, Confederate monuments. Once we get beyond Confederate monuments, uh, and I'm here uh, enlightened by Ned Gordon-Reed's comments last week in a panel she was on, that, you know, with Confederate monuments, we're talking about people who really uh, set up to destroy the nation. And they, uh, in calling for states' rights, and then in secession, and in trying to retain slavery, they really, uh, you know, the Civil War was an incredibly destructive act, and it was one that was about destroying uh, the United States as it was then known. So I'm pretty clear, with, but I do want to, I want to hear from Rice, I'm pretty clear that in most cases, taking down Confederate monuments, as Anne said, is about not only t um, recognizing that these people were traitors to the U.S. cause, to the U.S. nation, but also that the monuments were set up to reinforce white supremacy, to instill fear in Black Americans in particular, but also in, t in terms of allies, white allies to Black Americans in trying to create and to enforce the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. So 
from in, in the majority of cases, I'm very clear about that and about those monuments. I do think it gets complicated at times, and I think Woodrow Wilson is an example of that complication. Thomas Jefferson is another. These are people who, on the one hand, did things that strengthened our nation. Um, certainly, no one, you know, Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence, um, and other slave owners who built the Constitution, even as they continued slavery. I think we are in a different kind of conversation when we're talking about taking down those monuments, taking those names down. Is there a way to honor what they did to create the nation, but also to recognize that they did not go far enough? Um, so that's one uh, question I have. Um, the second is uh, a question about how do we um, get uh, local communities involved in these discussions and have a process that's honest about what the history is, and then how we want to commemorate the history, which if we're take, talking about an individual, how do we talk about all of the complicated things they did? So I'll take the Woodrow Wilson um, example at Princeton. Um, in the fall, one of the ways when they were still going to keep the name on the school, one of the things that they did was to invite um, a sculptor who put up what he called an anti-monument which encapsulated both the positive things about Wilson's career and the very negative things, the resegregation of the uh, federal government um, and, and a number of other, you know, the fact that he uh, thought that birth of a nation was history writ with lightning, um, all of these kinds of things. And so for me, the Woodrow Wilson School then became a very different site um, of, of commemoration not honoring, but complicating what had been on honorable, you know, complicating uh, this person. The decision to take down uh, the name down now, um, uh, barely uh, six or seven months later, I have questions about because um, one of my concerns um, in this moment is if there was a process and not everyone agreed with the outcome of the process, I, I hear that. But what does it mean then in the summer when students are away, although they continue to in influence via letter, there's a Google letter that they sent that um, I also saw. How do we think about the process that already happened when they made the decision not to take the name down? And then the president and the board of trustees on a Saturday say, well, we are gonna take the name down. Who's, in whose hands is the power at that point? What are the president and board of trustees saying about their previous process of community engagement? Nothing changed in Woodrow Wilson's history between that process and this one. And so I, I have to say, um, I know that it is a victory in some ways, but seeing the letter that the students wrote, which also asked for curricular changes, asked for diversifying faculty, asked for a more uh, expansive notion of international affairs. I have to say, why now? And I also, um, both with the taking down of the Confederate flags um, in the aftermath of the AME church massacre and here, why does flagrant black death have to be the moment at which these changes happen? Why, is not a, why are not our reasoned arguments and discussions and debates the uh, Confederacy was traitorous then, it's traitorous now. It was traitorous in 2015, it was traitorous before 2015. So I, I remain concerned that black reasoned arguments and uh, uh, allies, anti-racist allies and their reasoned arguments are not the basis for these decisions. It's really uh, a fear perhaps of quote unquote mob rule, which is, I'm not, I'm not claiming that the protests are that, but I wonder how that affects these decisions. And I, I just wonder about the process, which seems to me to have been um, circumvented yet again. And so then how do other things that are just as important as monuments um, change on college campuses? What now with the curricular discussions? What now with hiring a more diverse faculty? How do we expand our understanding of international affairs at a place like uh, Princeton or other forms of curricular change at other institutions. I'm I'm not sure. Thank you, and I, I think you you raised some important questions about process that it would be useful to to hear from the rest of the the panel about. I did want to pick up on one part of what you were, were saying with Wilson and the Confederacy, where you see these changes, even though we haven't really learned much new. 
uh, about them uh, between the time when calls were, were being made and these decisions uh, are coming down. I know uh, that Professor Twitty and, and Professor Green maybe could speak a little to some of the cases where uh, we do learn something new or maybe something that hadn't been known before that changes the contextualization of a particular monument. Uh, Professor Green, I'm curious, can you think of examples where um, archival research uh, has turned up information that was salient to these processes uh, and really changed the conversation because of what we knew about the history? And I'll use my example, the University of Alabama uh, for this. When I arrived in fall of 2014, there, uh, this, when you took the official tour, they would say, sadly, we lost. It's um, garden sheds instead of slave quarters, because we have four surviving um, outbuildings. There was no mention of the 2004 apology, no mention of the 2006 erection of the um, slavery apology marker. I started this work because of a black male student in January 2015 who said, well, Dr. Green, slavery didn't exist here. The narratives that the university was telling continued one of forgetfulness, one of silence, one of erasure. And I had several white male faculty members. I, I started doing this archival work, so well, we gave them a marker. And I had to respond, I'm like, well, if, who are the we and who are the they if we are all faculty at UA and this is the university committee? So it was silencing, forgetfulness, complicity to accept what was there. So I did an archival campaign just to get the names of the enslaved people that worked at the university. What spaces in the places they worked in. I'm in a building that's named after Basil Manley. And while everyone in this building talks about Manley, upstairs my neighbors call the, name the squirrels that they feed Basils. So <laughs> we have recontextualized this history, but it was not widespread. So developing a walk-in tour that started in a class because of a student now has reached almost 5,000 individuals. And getting them to see the campus say different names but complicate the history of slavery, the lost cause, um, George Wallace, all of that together. It's been a five-year effort that I think leads to the monument rule because we've been engaged in this conversation. And this question about teaching in the classroom but also opening it up for those who still will not step on our foot on our campus in the black community and black Tuscaloosans because of our history and our silence and complicity by not telling the full story. And our other issues of students, once they learn to like, why do we have this boulder? Why do we have these building names? Why should I remain and be here if no one listens to me? So those processes of changing the market, but also listening to the calls and the pleas of those who've been fighting and recently see the manifestations of these building names when they went go into. But archival work using UA's records to tell UA story undergirded the entire Hallow Grounds project and tour. And saying the names of those people in those spaces and introducing those names alongside those who enslaved them, those who were segregationists and denied rights has been words of wonder. So I think there's a way to use the space effectively to change the conversations but at the end when we have these processes to rename to decide what's new we also use that democratic space as a community and build community-based solutions and not top-down solutions to fix the problem because i'm concerned now is we have a we gave them a marker culture i'm afraid a we removed the marker culture will set in given this longer history of UA and other college campuses, because it's easier to remove and easier to add than it is to have those harder conversations. Thank you. And I know, um, you know, Professor Twitty, uh, it was mentioned by Dr. Bird that an Atlantic article uh, reflecting on an archival discovery about um, the speech that was given at the erection of the Confederate monument changed the conversation there. I know that a discovery of, of, of a, a speech that Frederick Douglass gave about the Emancipation uh, uh, Memorial in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Has, has really contributed to those conversations. And it seems to me, you know, in some ways, um, Professor Campbell, this brings us back to your, your observations about the university and what the university uh, can or should do. I'm struck that Professor Green said that this started in a class 
uh, and then grew into uh, a much larger community conversation from class to tour to uh, to community conversation. Did you find uh, as well, uh, Professor Campbell, that that uh, classes and archival research um, changed the the conversation at Brown University? Um, oh. Yeah, certainly. I, you know, I think that one of the things, a kind of advantage that we had, if, if you will, at Brown was most people's initial response was, well, this is Rhode Island. We had nothing to do with slavery. Aren't we the people who like march south to free the slaves? And uh, the history, not only of the fact that Rhode Island had had slavery, but that Rhode Islanders had dominated the North American portion of the transatlantic slave trade for the better part of a century and a half. Um, you know, launching some 10,000 ships um, to West Africa to transport enslaved people. Um, most people's initial response was, wow, I didn't know that. Why wasn't this in our history books, right? And so you, you, there was, I think we had it in some ways uh, easier, if you will, than, than people at University of Alabama or University of Mississippi might have, where there's a kind of immediate assumption that we know this history and we don't want to go there. I mean, I, I just want to amplify something that I think has been coming up in this conversation about, about monuments and memorials. You know, one of the things I think that, that we're living through right now is a kind of moment of what I think of as the politics of recognition, where in, increasingly rights claims, which historically, you know, the last couple hundred years at least, have typically been articulated in a liberal language, a language of you know, universal rights of all individuals. We are entitled to these things irrespective of the color of our skin or our sex or whatever it might be. Increasingly, we see rights claims uh, articulated in a demand for recognition in the public sphere of those collective identities that we cherish, including often collective experiences of trauma or suffering. And, um, at one level, I think this has been healthy. It reflects the fact that we are not individual atoms, that we actually live in society and we experience our lives and fulfillment and our pursuit of happiness in collective ways. It's certainly that kind of sensitivity to issues of recognition that has made possible the kind of focus on monuments and memorials and names and demands that memorials be put up to acknowledge histories that have been previously erased or that memorials come down that uh, inscribe histories. So I, I'm not against it. My concern is that, you know, this should be the beginning of the conversation, not at the end, right? Our goal here should not be simply to control the, you know, the memorial landscape, right? I mean, the, you mentioned the piece that Professor Twitty published in Atlantic, uh, where she, you know, uncovered the speech that had been delivered at the dedication. I'm sorry, you should probably tell the story, Annie, but uh, had, you know, um, where the speech at the dedication of that Confederate memorial at the top of the Oval, you know, and it is a ringing uh, endorsement of white supremacy and it hails the legions of Confederate troops from Ole Miss, not simply for their role in the Civil War, but for defending Anglo-Saxon civilization in the aftermath of the war during the Reconstruction. If you look at Julian Shakespeare Carr's dedicatory speech at Silent Sam, the monument at the University of North Carolina, again, it's just an, it's, it's an appalling statement about uh, white supremacy. He talks about, you know, again, how the legions of University of North Carolina saved Anglo-Saxon civilization from Reconstruction and tells a little humorous anecdote about he, how he himself, returning to the campus from Appomattox, uh, whipped a Negro wench until her skirt hung in shreds for having had the temerity of insulting a white lady, right? And of course, the crowd laughs. So give Julian Shakespeare Carr his due. These guys were not simply trying to control the memorial landscape. They saw these monuments, and again, these things are being built in the early 20th century. They're not built in the immediate aftermath. They're built in the second 25 years after the end of the Civil War. They are, these are props in, a, in a, an assertion of white supremacy. And I kind of wish, I kind of hope that um, 
that the people who are now so intent on taking these monuments down, and like Leslie, I worry that we don't yet know what the process is supposed to be, when, how that's supposed to happen, and where we draw lines. But I hope that those people who are advocating transformations of the memorial landscape are talking about, thinking about more than that. You know, so you could turn out a thousand students to topple Silent Sam at the University of North Carolina. I, I won't miss him. But, you know, North Carolina also has one of the most draconian voter suppression regimes in the country. North Carolina has a system of gerrymanding that a federal appeals court said targeted Negro voters with surgical precision. To me, those are the issues that we really need to be focusing on. Right? And so if telling a more complete, a more truthful, a more inclusive history, version of our past, can alter the matrix of political possibility in the present, can create new space for us to actually ask what are future generations going to say about us? What are the things that we are complicit in? What is incumbent on us now to perfect our union? That I really hope that this work is about a springboard into that kind of politics. And I worry mm -hmm. that we have become so preoccupied with these symbols, with these memorials that, you know, you turn out a group, they topple the thing, they go home. And to me, that's not the end of the work. That's the beginning of the work. Well, I think you've given us some examples of how uh, history can, can illuminate uh, the meaning of these monuments and point us to uh, different possibilities. Um, Professor Twitty, I know you've also spoken um, eloquently about not just what students can learn from history, but maybe what we as faculty members and universities can learn from students. Um, who I think in many cases are, uh, you know, offering a, a, a more substantive and, and far-reaching uh, vision than just a focus on, mm -hmm. on monuments. And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that of um, either on your campus or, or beyond it, um, how have students shaped and, and informed these conversations that universities are having? Well, I want to note, I think, first of all, that, that students are sometimes very active parts of the sort of research agenda. Um, the, the speech that, mm -hmm. that uh, Jim was just referencing, given by Julian Carr, um, when the UNC Confederate Monument was was built, was rediscovered by a then graduate student, Adam Dombey. And um, I, Hillary and I were just having this exchange on, on Twitter this, this morning. Um, Hillary's website features that entire speech. Um, and it's, a, it's an amazing sort of teaching tool if you want to understand, you know, what these monuments were all about. And Lot of different places, you know, we've all kind of referenced them. There have been these these seminars um, where you know either graduate students or undergraduate students or both working together um, have really done a lot of archival work. I know here at the University of Mississippi, um, the slavery research group was was fortunate enough to be able to um, to hire two graduate research assistants, Chet Bush and Andrew Marion, and they uncovered a whole host of things that we maybe had some dim awareness of, but really helped flush them out and helped us tell stories, not just not just finding a name, but finding enough out about a person that they become an actual person in somebody's mind. They're not just a name on a, a sheet of paper or a name on a, a, on a bronze somewhere, um, but, but actual flesh and blood people. Um, so I think they've been a very important part of the research process. They've also been absolutely central to these conversations about not just what we commemorate and what kind of statues we should have on our campus, but how administrations should communicate with students and what administrations owe students. You know, all of the students who have demanded either the relocation or the absolute removal of the Confederate monument at the University of Mississippi have been part of a much, much broader series of demands um, about making the University of Mississippi a campus that is more welcoming, especially to black students, but, but all minority students, um, about rectifying the, the dismally small percentage of, of minority faculty, especially black faculty, especially in a state that has the largest black population of any state in the United States. Um, they are well aware that those indicators lag well behind um, where they ought to be. Um, and, and these are broader conversations, broader sort of demands. Um, and, and I think, you know, one of the moves, and we've all kind of hinted at this, one of the moves that we're seeing now is 
an attempt, I think, by those in power to try to buy off those student movements with a statue. Well, what if we just take down this statue? Won't you be happy then? This is what you want, right? And acting as though a fulfillment of that one demand, which in some ways is by far and away the easiest demand to satisfy, um, then absolves them of any further sort of efforts um, in, 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 that, in that vein. And I will tell you, you know, here at the University of Mississippi right now, the conversation that we're having about the Confederate monument, the conversation that we're having about uh, the Civil War Cemetery on campus, it is as much about um, the, the lack of transparency in how these decisions were made um, and, a, and a complete disinterest among administrators and against the institutions of higher learning board in shared governance, um, something that should be near and dear to the hearts of of everybody on university campuses. So, you know, something that Leslie was mentioning earlier, the, these questions about who gets to decide, who gets to be in the room where it happens, right? Who, who gets to participate? And, you know, here, the model has long been, it's a small group, usually of men, but a small group um, has met behind closed doors and made these decisions. And I think what all of us in all of our different work have said over and over and over again, is that this has to be a public conversation all stakeholders need to be involved in, in these decision-making processes. And that once you initiate this conversation, it's not just suddenly going to be over when you want it to be over. It's not gonna suddenly be over when you take the name off a building or when you relocate a statue because they are inextricably connected to these broader demands for justice. Well, I think that's a, a good segue to uh, a question I wanted to make sure that we we turned to. And I know that there's some, some questions in the Q&A, so Dr. Bird will, We'll come on in a moment to pose some of those to you all. Um, but Professor Harris, just based on you know your experience with uh, all of these movements uh, on campuses, the task force at Rice is just really getting underway with its work. Um, and I'm wondering what advice you would give to uh, our task force in in navigating these questions. Um, if 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 you were uh, going to give us some recommendations. One of the things that I did at Emory, uh, you mentioned the transfer, Alex mentioned the Transforming Community Project, which was, um, I have to say, some of the most amazing work I've ever done in my career. We established a series of community dialogues. So faculty, staff, students, and alums committed to meeting together over a meal to explore the history of race at Emory. And um, I have to say, even as an historian, I was a little bit skeptical about what change would happen simply because of talking about this history. But we had to all, some of us, we had to get on the same page, or at least in the same library is what I used to say, about what the history was. We, we had some conversations after a series of racial events, uh, incidents at Emory, and it was really clear that people had very different ideas about what the racial history and the racial experience in the present day of the university was. We had all the right numbers, we had all the right people on campus, diversity was happening, but it wasn't happening. And that experience of having honest conversations, uh, we then made it into this university-wide uh, program. So there were a couple of things that were a hallmark of that that I think as moving forward, you should really think about. And we've, I think Anne just said it as well, Hillary's work, Jim's work, transparency was key. How do we as institutions be honest about our histories? And I wanna say again that the other thing I would add to that, so transparency also recognizing that this isn't gonna end immediately. So I initially set up that program as a five-year project, which would give, you know, they're always early adopters, people who are eager, but then as um, we continued the work, more and more people became interested in it. And we also presented the work in a number of different ways. So we had the community dialogues, which were an intense commitment. We had public programs. We had people who, after they went through a community dialogue, could put on their own small program in their place of work or in their dormitory. So having a number of different ways in which people can participate. I also want to emphasize that we've been talking a lot about staff, um, faculty and students, but our institutions are often a huge part of our communities, small towns, cities, or states, because they're the largest or among the largest employers. When we change, we don't only change those institutions and we don't only change for students, we ripple out into those communities. 
And that's a really important thing to think about. So the most people who participated in our program were staff members who had been bearing the brunt of some of this racism because of their class status or lack of status, because they were not faculty and students. And this gave them an opportunity to understand the institution and to create change as well. And not only in their workplaces, but also when they went out um, into the greater Atlanta area. So I guess, you know, it's calling for what I think we've all been saying about the monuments discussion is that the monuments, as Jim very well said, might be the first step, but they're far from the last step. And um, one other thing I'll say um, that was said to me about someone else who works on race is that, you know, in this country, we think it's, you know, there's almost no other topic with, um, with which we would think it's okay to have like a sixth graders understanding or a third graders understanding of the topic. But with the ideas about race or racial history, we have often thought that that's okay. You know, the sort of the touch my hair, you know, can I touch your hair? I've never touched a black person's hair. Like this idea that you can have this really naive understanding of race and racism. And the Transforming Community Project was for us an attempt to elevate that conversation. Finally, the other thing I'll say is that if people were afraid initially, there are ways to set up these structures so that they are, we move from fear to creativity. And certainly in the moment that we're in right now as a nation on so many levels, what is going to get us out of our difficult moments from coronavirus to police brutality is moving from fear to greater creativity in thinking through these problems. And certainly higher education institutions are the place for that, but we need to model that much more broadly than higher education institutions. We really need to tap into our larger creativity and our larger humanity to solve these very difficult problems. Thank you so much. Uh, and Dr. Bird, do you want to uh, take over here and see if there's some questions in the audience that we can address to the panel? We've got a few and we have way more than we can get to. So as I said at the start, we'll be, um, we, we will get to them all eventually in the, in the weeks ahead. Um, one um, that I think prompted by um, one of Professor Harris's comments about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, is there a few people interested in what can be learned from international examples um, um, like the um, Truth and Reconciliation in South Africa? Um, but, but also um, post-World uh, War II um, Germany. That there are folks who are interested in hearing some of the panel's responses um, about that. And then uh, I'll, I'll drop two questions in and then I'll, I'll wait and we'll see about time. Um, we, we also have a question uh, uh, about um, whether, whether this work um, puts um, 21st century, necessarily puts 21st century ethics, brings it to bear, um, on our on our deeper past, and, and and so a few people were interested in hearing um, responses um, to to that question. And I'll pop back in if there if there's time. I can I'll um, give a try to give a very brief answer to that. One of the things that we did at Brown, and you can find the Slavery and Justice Report online. It's just free. It's just Google the report of the Brown uh, Committee on Slavery and Justice and you'll find it. Um, a lot of our public programs at Ruth Simmons uh, instigation were precisely about international uh, antecedents and parallels. And so the middle third of the report is exactly about the Nuremberg legacy, the experience of truth and reconciliation commissions. And everyone thinks of the South African example, but there've been over two dozen of them around the world about uh, war crimes tribunals, about the politics of national institutional apologies, about reparations, both uh, monetary reparations and other forms of reparations, about monuments and memorials. Part of what I think we were trying to do at that time, I mean, as Professor Harris mentioned, the early 2000s, uh, there were a series of class action lawsuits around slavery reparations. And that was kind of the, the gravitational center that every conversation about redress and repair was suddenly reduced to this question of who was supposed to write a check to whom, which is a very unprofitable conversation. And if you look around the world, you see a, a, an array of modalities for confronting painful histories and trying to move forward in their aftermath. And so, the, so uh, again, we wrote a third of the report is about precisely that, and I commend it to your attention. 
to sum it up in one tiny little nugget, the short answer is that no form of redress is adequate to the trauma, to the horror that, that necessitates it, right? But that doesn't mean that we're helpless. There are things that can be done. And I'll add to that because I look at the international models a lot and think about how I work on my um, subject. And the first thing I always say is establishing the truth. And if you're not establishing what a truthful, fuller history is, it doesn't matter what comes next. And so for me, overcoming and establishing what is the truth, and in this case, what is the truth of the enslaved experiences? Who were they? How many? What were their numbers like? And then more importantly, my work study the Reconstruction era. What happened to them? So the university ended slavery in 1865, but who still worked on our campus? But the descendants of the <laughs> enslaved people. Who built the black community in Tuscaloosa? The descendants of the slave community. So what happens when you drop out the university and you consider the wide ripple effects of the pain and trauma of a labor system instituted at the university? So establishing those truth lines to help move across from pain, oh, that wasn't my generation, that wasn't there, to how can we have productive conversations once we all establish what that truthfulness is and move beyond truth to the next steps of the transitional justice model and the other international models that we have there. But that truth telling, I think is that important necessary first step. I wanted to take on this question about the ethics of 21st century reading back um, words. Everything uh, that we're talking about was talked about in the 18th and 19th century, certainly. Um, the first anti-slavery, seeing slavery as wrong uh, documents were uh, printed, uh, published among the Quakers, uh, I think 1699, the Germantown petition, Samuel Sewell in the early uh, 1700s. Through the Revolutionary War, uh, Lafayette repeatedly asked uh, his friend Thomas Jefferson and others to think about ending slavery. Uh, there was an anti-slavery movement. There were discussions of expanding the meaning of human rights. There were people who were making anti-racist arguments down to and through the Civil War. So to imagine that uh, our 21st century um, ethics have no relationship to earlier ethics is actually uh, inaccurate. We have overemphasized uh, pro-slavery ideologies and racist ideologies, and those ideologies have moved on, and we have avoided um, looking to, for example, the radical abolitionists. And many historians from most of the 20th century call the radical abolitionists insane. They blame them for causing the Civil War. So we really have to rethink um, our, um, uh, our understanding of those histories. I look at the radical abolitionists as the root of many of our modern practices of um, non-electoral -polit non politics, mass movements. Uh, boycotting um, goods, uh, using the press, uh, uh, all of these things. If you even think about Uncle Tom's Cabin, all of these kinds of things, we still use these today in terms of our political activism. So they are almost a new founding group for us in terms of understanding. So there are many ethical places that we can draw from. And in the 21st century, I think we're ready to draw from a new set. I think that's a, a great point. And, you know, just to bring that point a little bit closer to home, uh, you know, I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that William Marsh Rice, uh, who came to Texas at the end of the 1830s, moved here from Massachusetts. In other words, he left a state and a region where there was a vibrant abolitionist movement uh, already underway and decided to come to Texas, which was very clearly a, uh, a frontier of the expansion of slavery. So it's not as though those choices were made in a vacuum, um, but they were made at a time where uh, there, were, there were many men of their times or women of their times uh, who, were, who were developing different ethical standpoints on institutions like slavery. Can I say one more thing too? Um, you're reminding me, many Southerners were educated in the North in institutions where this discussion and debate was alive and well, and they very consciously turned their back on the idea of anti-slavery. So, you know, this sort of, they were just born into it. They didn't know any better. They had opportunities to see differently and they made a conscious decision to hold on to slavery. Yeah, I, I, I remember, remember to, uh, yeah. 
Go ahead. Right. Uh, the University of Mississippi, you know, was founded in, in 1848 as uh, a pro-slavery institution that, that slaveholder sons can attend so that they won't be sent to those, those you know, hotbeds of abolitionism uh, in the North so that they won't imbibe. But that's in 1848, right? That, that's, a, that's a very late point in, in the nation's antebellum history. And I guess I would also add, um, when we think about these figures, um, some of whom have, have statues uh, or buildings named after them and, and kind of what we do with them, you know, most of us, if, if, if we're lucky, we get to live long lives and we do lots of things over the course of our lives. Um, and sometimes the totality of what it is that we do pulls in a single direction and we become associated with it. And sometimes, you know, we're, we're incoherent folks who contain multitudes and, and, and we do lots of things over the course of our lives. But I would say that the monuments debate, as, as opposed to the, the conversations that we might have about these men and who they were, because they're almost all men, these men and who they were and, and, and what they were about and what they were attempting to do and the kinds of historical antecedents that they drew upon um, in, in understanding their world. That's one conversation and you know, you're, you're having a panel of historians. That's what we're really good at talking about. But when you're talking about um, commemoration and monuments, that's, you know, really, I think, primarily a conversation about us uh, in the 21st century and the types of things, the types of symbols that we want to represent our societies and, and who we are. So rather than thinking about, I think, the statues as being about these men, I think I think there has to be a sort of recognition that you know these are this, this is a conversation about um, symbols and and every generation deserves the opportunity to decide for itself what kinds of symbols they want. We we shouldn't be beholden to um, you know the, the the dead hand of the past here um, forever simply because at one point in that society's history. Um, something was cast in bronze or something was chiseled out of out of marble. So these are conversations about us and what we want. And this is, I think I would also say why I think historians are a very important part of this conversation, but we can't and we shouldn't be the final arbiters uh, of this debate. This is a public conversation that should engage and involve everyone living today in a society who cares about how we represent ourselves and how we tell stories about ourselves. Are we doing on time, Dr. Bird? Do we have time for we're, uh, we're, one more question? We're, we're a little over. Um, I will I will say that the hardest questions that showed up in the in the in the Q and A were addressed in the meat of the discussion. So that's a real um, that's a, a real service, I, I think. And the hardest questions were about um, what 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 comes after the the, the pedagogy. Um, around recontextualization and, and removal. And, and so well, now I'm speaking from the audience. I really appreciated hear, hearing those addressed in, in real time as, a, as the questions went, um, came in. Um, I, I wanna remind everyone um, in attendance that um, we will um, post this uh, discussion on the um, university's YouTube channel um, and it should be up by um, tomorrow. Um, I also want to encourage all the participants um, and, and just reiterate that this is the beginning of a, of a discussion and a beginning of a discussion that we will have, uh, a conversation that we will have in, in different ways in, in the weeks to come. Um, I love to listen to historians, uh, and so I could do this until December, but this won't be the only way that, that we do it, and, and in the weeks to come, um, there will be opportunities, various types of opportunities, um, additional ways for you in the audience to participate in our, in our work as well. Um, as the school year um, opens, um, there will also be opportunities um, in the classroom um, and in, in, in some of your colleges as well um, to participate in this work. Um, I want to uh, thank all the panelists again. Um, I also want to thank um, Ryan Kirksey in the Office of the President who handled all of the technical aspects of the, of the webinar. Uh, and just one last time before I pitch it back to Dr. McDaniel, I want to encourage you to keep up, um, all of you in the audience, to keep up with what we're doing at um, taskforce.rice.edu. Um, thanks so much um, for your time, folks out um, in the audience. Um, thanks for spending your lunch hour um, with us.
Dr. McDaniel. Yes, thank you so much to uh, all of you who came and to all of our panelists. I wanted to close uh, with a quotation from Lonnie Bunch, who's the secretary of the Smithsonian Institute and was the founding director of the National Museum on African American History and Culture. He had a, an interview, maybe some of you saw it in uh, New York Times yesterday, in which he said that history often teaches us to embrace ambiguity, to understand that there aren't simple answers to complex questions. And Americans tend to like simple answers to complex questions. So the challenge is to use history to help the public feel comfortable with nuance and complexity. I think that's what each of you have done uh, here today by bringing your expertise to bear on these complex questions. And we look forward to continued conversations uh, with all of you in the audience and throughout the Rice community in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you all, have a great day. <laughs>